start recording. Good evening, everybody. Hello. So we'll call the meeting to order. It's 6.32 p.m. Um, so why don't we start with uh, present to speak. If there's anybody on the call that wants to um, share with us, just state your name. Okay, um, so chairperson report. So there was a, so a question about the Collier's contract among the committee. And um, I believe you all received my email regarding that. But basically we do have a Collier's contract. As you know, Scott uh, Palman is here uh, working for Collier's and it has been fully executed. Um, and just for clarity, the original RFP that the task group created is actually part of the contract. Um, same with their proposal. So both of those items are included in the contract. Um, just a quick update. There is a Willington wire being published uh, for this spring. And um, I believe the communications committee has developed that. And uh, Phil will be talking about that further down the minutes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then the last thing, uh, there is an item on the agenda under new business for a discussion of future use of school buildings. I just wanted to remind the committee members just the specific language that's outlined in our charge and how it's worded is the SPC charge is to identify potential future uses of the two current school buildings if necessary. And one of the reasons it's on the agenda for tonight is because we're, we're trying to maximize the, uh, our efforts and to try to um, tackle some of the items on our charge while other things are happening. For example, the ed specs are currently uh, being drafted and are uh, going through uh, different reviews through the school system and the, the Board of Education. So that, that's a task that's happening sort of outside of this. <clears throat> And so um, trying to just keep our uh, focus on the tasks that we have in front of us. So that, that's what we're going to be talking about further down. Um, so that's all I have for my chairman report. And so we can move on to approval of the meeting minutes. Um, there were three meeting minutes. Uh, land assessment subcommittee meeting happened on February 28th. Uh, the SBC meeting minute from March 2nd and then the SBC Finance Committee meeting from March 11th. Are there any objections? If Should I, should I call a vote for um, all three of them or should I do one at a time? Ralph? I, I would I say one at a time. One at I a would, time, okay. We, we don't, I, I, sorry, I have no ahead. minutes for the Finance Committee. Because that is correct, which is if I could finish, uh, I'd say one at a time, Catherine. We, we met, but the minutes haven't been filed yet. Okay. All righty. All right. So let's uh, go with the SBC Land Assessment Committee meeting minutes from February 28th. Uh, is there a motion on the table to approve these minutes? Brianna? Thank you. A second. second. Ralph? Okay, all in favor? I mean, any discussion? Sorry. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any nays? Abstentions. Okay, motion carries. All right, we'll move on to the SPC meeting minutes of March 2nd. Is there a motion on the table? I'll move to approve the minutes from March 2nd. Okay, Erica, second. Is there a second? Oh, Brianna. Okay, um, discussion? No discussion. All right, let's take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any nays? Abstentions. 
motion carries meeting minutes from SBC March 2nd meeting approved. And then we'll just, uh, we'll table the next one until our next meeting, right? We'll put that on our next agenda. Okay, any communications? Um, I have not received anything from the SBC email. Um, no additional updates from that. Uh, subcommittee reports. And so we've got communications, land assessment, and finance. Um, so I'll, I'll start with Phil. Phil was there. Did you guys have a meeting for? So we did not meet, but um, we did work on through Google Docs. We worked on the next Wellington Wire article. Um, and so we have an article ready to go. Ran it past Catherine. Uh, it'll be emailed out to the full committee. And remember that your um, communication plan basically is that Catherine approves all of those communications out. So there's it's basically five or six paragraphs. Um, first paragraph is basically introducing Scott, letting the community know that we hired an owner's project manager, um, and that was Collier's. Um, the second paragraph is about what we're evaluating right now, kind of the two scenario route. First scenario being renovation of fall school, um, and the second scenario being a new uh, new building, pre-K through eight consolidated uh, building uh, on a new site. Um, and one of the things that's in there is, and I know the I watched the land assessment committee meeting um, video on YouTube, and I know that uh, Mike's not here, but I know that group uh, Mike said he was they were going to recommend um, asking townspeople if they they had any land they usable land that they wanted to donate. And so there's a line in that uh, section of our two scenarios that we're evaluating. And it basically just says anyone with a minimum of 20 usable acres that wants to discuss donating land can contact Catherine. It's basically the SBC email. Um, third paragraph is basically just talking about ed specs um, that the board is working on them and just for all of you information, eight, we just set a date today, April 5th, is when the Board of Ed is going to be uh, taking their first go around at Ed Specs. Don't ask me the time because I don't know the time off the top of my head yet, um, but it will be April 5th. Um, next paragraph was just that the committee did uh, an enrollment study and it talks about uh, Prouda and there's a link to the study um, and just kind of the overall what, what he pre predicted. Um, and then the last main paragraph was just what we did last week around CIP projects for um, for the school district and what's, you know, that there's uh, quite a few things out there should, you know, um, as we continue to stay. And then the last paragraph is really just general, like, here's where you can find our minutes, here's where you can find agendas, here's the YouTube videos, it's all of that information. So that will, um, it's due next week. Um, to go to the town. Uh, Erica, do you know when it's actually going out? No, I know our hope is to have it out by April 1st. So it's, exactly. we're asking everyone to get their information in so that it can be, the document can be put together um, and it hopefully to go out by April 1st. Okay. Thank you much. You're welcome. That's all I have. Great, that's awesome. Yeah, it, it, it was definitely, um, a, a lot of progress and um, it, it'll be good to get this out in, in the Wellington Wire and, uh, and have more of the people see what progress we've made over the last few months. Uh, land assessment, I, I don't know, should we, should we table that until Mike, uh, maybe next meeting we'll get an update or maybe one of the committee members, I don't know. Well, I can maybe Ralph and I could do it real quick. I'm, I'm not, yeah. I, I don't think there's much to report. We met on, uh, was it Monday, right, Ralph? Yeah. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, as uh, as Phil actually mentioned, we did look at the, uh, the town-owned properties um, and uh, Scott from Collier's helped us do sort of an assessment of, of uh, the suitability of any of those town-owned sites for, uh, for a, a consolidated school. Uh, and we also talked about a concept for a K through eight school at the Hall School property, <clears throat> the current Hall School property. Um, 
I think that's what I would report at this time. Ralph, anything to add? Uh, no, not really. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And finance subcommittee. Finally, a report from us. <laughs> We, we we did meet last Friday, thanks to the good graces of Erica organizing us to meet um, in person, which was refreshing. Um, myself and Justin and Erica are on the committee with Scott, of course, supporting us. Uh, it was an organizational meeting. I drew the short straw and will be chair. And we are, we're going to focus on providing the full committee with financial data as we move forward through our, pro our project um, so that we have a basis for discussion from a, a fiscal point of view, which we recognize is only one variable of many uh, in whatever this committee finally decides. Um, our first step is to evaluate our current per pupil cost and compare that to our two potential projects, renovation or new and what that cost would be. Um, so we're working with Erica and Phil, I'm sure, um, on what a generic 60,000 square foot building on a 20 acre lot uh, or, or property would represent and start looking at that data uh, prior to comparing both projects in their own right, which we can't do till we have the ed specs. And we discussed that a bit at the meeting. So our homework right now is to, is to look at our current per pupil cost and see how that might favorably change with either project that we're considering. And we are going to meet on the same nights that this full great idea by Erica uh, will be before this meeting uh, economize meeting nights. Remind me when we haven't had dinner that we thought that was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> true, true, true. <laughs> we'll all go on a diet, I guess. <laughs> okay, and then all of, uh, all of the, thank you, Peter, for the update. Did you have anything else? I'm sorry. No, I'm, it was a good good meeting, and uh, it was great to have everybody there and, and get off to a good start. And now any of the SBC members are also welcome to pop in. Um, I had every intention of popping in last time, and, and then something happened, and I wasn't there. Um, but I, I did have every intention of popping in, and, and everybody else on the, sub, the SBC committee can do the same as well as the public, because that is a public meeting. Okay, uh, lunch, let's jump down to old business, owner's project manager. Uh, Colliers will get an update. Thank you, Catherine. Scott Pellman from Colliers. Um, yeah, as the committee is aware, um, Phil and I have uh, taken a couple passes, a couple runs through, um, just defining sort of the, the basic foundation of an ed spec, which is the spaces required for a new K-8 school. Um, just a listing of spaces and sizes of rooms based on uh, past history, need, also looking at recommendations off the um, school construction website as far as uh, size of, of rooms. Um, and we've put that together and, um, you know, Phil is now working with that with his administrators and, and the board um, and what we thought might be beneficial. And I believe Phil's ready to do this tonight is to just go through a little bit more about the um, more the intricacies of an ed spec, what it is, show you an example of another district's ed spec. So this committee can understand what goes into an ed spec and how it's instrumental in really defining not just the bricks and mortar, but how a school is going to operate and what are the other things required to, to make a successful school that's all included in that ed spec. And, and the key of getting a really well-written ed spec is um, you know, if and when at the time, if we go to the state for state support, if it's in the ed spec and they approve the project in the grant, they're gonna reimburse you on it. But you wanna make sure you don't forget anything that everything is very clear that you don't have to come back and revise your ed spec because that's when you get into challenges. So. Again, we want to just make sure that, that the ed spec is, is 
is well-developed, properly vetted, and accurately reflects all of the requirements that the town of Willington would need for a unified K-8 school. And so for the moment, I guess I'll, I'll turn it over to Phil maybe to, to dive a little bit deeper into what is the ed spec. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, and, and thanks, Scott. So really the ed spec, and, and Scott was talking about the spaces, and it's really the, the connection between the spatial requirement and what the learning activities are. And so that's what really what the board is defining. Um, and you know what that definition really is about how do we get student success? And again, the balance of the learning activities with the spatial requirements. So I'm just gonna speak for a couple minutes and then I'll open up. You have a sample, I think already in your folder or several. Um, and for anybody that's watching the video or on the call, uh, there's also on the district uh, Wellington School Public Schools website, there is uh, an old sample on there from 1990. It is outdated significantly. Um, and we won't, won't even really reference that at all. Um, and then there's a newer one that's on there just as a sample from, I believe it's from Mansfield. That's what I showed tonight. Um, there's really six things when you start doing, looking at the ed specs of what you're looking for and what you're gonna identify in this document. One is, is um, you know, as you create 21st century education spaces, you're looking for student-centered classrooms and you know the kind of learning by doing thought process. Um, and so that number one is really creating learning spaces that are um, designed for the current instructional strategies th that are supported by research. The second thing is technology updates. Um, you know, when you start talking about technology and the importance of education, that's identified in this in this document. And I'll get further into details with, with all of these things. Um, third thing is is current building and fire code. Um, obviously, it's one of those things that's hurting us right now and our inability just to move kids from center school to hall um, is, is fire code. Uh, fourth thing is updated in, in, you know, really the design for school security is significantly different than uh, what we have in our current buildings. And that's uh, something that you consider. Uh, fifth thing is really efficient systems. So heating, cooling, um, all the mechanicals, things like that. And then the sixth thing is really the uh, ADA compliance and making sure that you know everything is accessible for all students. So in the general document, and there are several examples of this, um, some are more thorough than others, um, but like Scott said, you wanna make sure you're thorough. So if it's in there, it's reimbursable. And so typically these documents start out with, with uh, you know Board of Education mission statements, their goals, um, things like that. Ours are already in this in our draft. Um, next section is really around project rationale. And so kind of how did we get here? And uh, what are we looking to do? And so, you know, sometimes you address whatever your issues, current issues are. Um, you could address enrollment, um, maybe connectivity and, and, you know, technology. For us, for sure, the mechanical systems are, are part of that challenge. Um, just the space efficiencies, thinking about all of those little spaces at Hall right now that are not efficient for what we're trying to do. Um, things like that. So daylight, there's a whole bunch of things that you could put into rationale. Why are we looking to it? One of the big pieces for us for rationale is that we're looking for a, a combined pre-K through eighth grade building. So it's one building for all students. Um, that's probably one of the biggest pieces. Um, the next section is typically around your long-term plan. Uh, and that's around your enrollment. And so you're gonna share, you know, we would have our enrollment data in there. And the long-term plan, and Scott has mentioned this, could also be about, do you have the ability to expand if you needed to? Um, and what flexibility do you have in your in your space? Um, whether it's a renovation or, or a new building. And, and no matter what project, these ed specs are written, could be written for, are, are written, um, and they could be applied to a renovation or a new building, okay? Um, then when you start getting into the project, the actual project that you want to do, and this is where uh, Scott and I have already spent some significant time on, we start talking about building space requirements. So we, obviously we walked tall, we start looking at the size of classrooms, and then we're identifying right now, and this is where I'll be sharing with the Board of Education, the specifics. So you start talking about how many classrooms do I need? What is the size of each of those classrooms? What are some of those specialty rooms? So meaning, what do you need? How many science rooms do you need? What do they look like? How many world language labs do you need? What does it look like? 
Um, what do you need for a life skills class for special education? What, what types of special education places, uh, rooms do you need? Um, all of those things get factored in. So library media centers in there, um, you know, the gym, admin sections, so, you know, social workers, every space is then identified and how much space. And there's a, uh, and Scott, you can clarify this if I'm wrong, but there's, I believe there's a typical space standard for a typical, uh, you know, general size for a classroom uh, and a general size for an office, um, cafeteria, gym. You want to add anything to that, Scott? No, I think I think that that summarizes. Yeah, I mean, just you know, we've looked at what the recommended state space standards are, um, as well as you know, we we work on a number of projects throughout the state of Connecticut. So you know, what other municipalities are doing as far as education, class sizes. Um, again, if you've got some very uh, defined maximum class sizes, you may be able to go a little bit smaller in the classroom, but to give yourself some flexibility and room for growth you might go a little bit larger. So we're taking all those factors into account. Right, and then the, the other part of that is a grade configuration. So do you want to, even though you could have a pre-K through eighth grade building, do you want, how much interaction do you want? What grade levels do you not mind interaction with? Um, and what you know ways do you wanna set up so there is absolutely collaboration and grades are, are mixing? So those are things that you factor into uh, an ed spec. Um, the next section is really around um, building systems. And this is really, really critical for me, I think, is just thinking about all the, the physical facility itself. You know, we're talking about in our CIP plan, all of the security upgrades, um, new uh, system for announcements, um, security strobes, talking about the ability for double vestibules, um, things like, you know, there's, there's, there's ways to lock doors, there's all sorts of security upgrades that you can build in and communications pieces are part of that. So how is your building wired and, and what is it set up to do? Um, part of the building requirements are, you know, what, what the, the Wi-Fi ability, the, the internet capability that you have. Um, what kind of requirements do you want for uh, electric? And I know this sounds silly, but think about our current status in the day and age of, of technology and think about a classroom at center school that has one plug in the front of the room and one plug in the back of the room. That doesn't meet your standard right now for what you would do, um, but that's what they're they're set up with right now. Some of the things that you'll consider, you know, if you wanted a TV studio and what those video requirements are, if you're going to broadcast out, what do you need for? Um, ooh, I've got a wicked echo right now. Um, what do you need for if you're going to uh, have a news station and you're going to broadcast? What types of capabilities do you need for that? Um, so again, fire alarm systems, security, heating, ventilation. Um, you know, that's the AC, that's the fresh air into plumbing. Um, we've talked about plumbing recently and a lot of the plumbing, moving my phone away from me, see if that's what it is. Uh, a lot of the plumbing obviously is, is original to those buildings that we currently have. Um, so that's something that you want to write into uh, your red specs and how you would use it. Um, elevator, lighting, windows, doors, all of that stuff. So, you know, we talk about windows and the single pane windows that are in some schools. You're not going to say, I want a, this type of window, but you are going to explain that, you know, how we're going to get natural lighting and we want as much natural lighting as, as we can. The next section is really around uh, uh, equipment. Um, and that equipment is, is really what goes in those regular classrooms. Um, what do you need for technology? What do you need in special education classrooms? We start talking about 21st century rooms and flexible spaces and looking for desks that are movable. Um, and it's really about the student and not the teacher. The old days of, um, and no offense to anybody when I say the old days, but the day, old days of lining up your desks in a row um, with a chalkboard in front of the room is not how we educate kids anymore. And so the ability to move desks quickly um, and safely, and I have some videos that I'll be showing the Board of Education. Um, there's a, a teacher that I'll show a short video, has a canoe in her room, um, and it, it's feeding inside of the canoe. Uh, she has, there's uh, music classes that have basically elevated, you know, areas for students to sit and be able to perform and see and in practice. So all of those things for equipment are considered as you write these ed specs in. 
Um, again, same thing with the kitchen. What do you need in the, in the kitchen um, and the cafeteria? Um, nurse's office, all of those things. What do you want in your gymnasium? Uh, some people are, are considering uh, ropes kind of things now where there's belay systems kind of similar to what we have right now, all school, a climbing wall. Those are things you would want to write into your ed spec. The last thing I'll share, and then I'll show you the, just really quickly go through the Mansfield one, is some of the environmental considerations um, when you're writing ed specs. And, you know, one of the biggies here is, is lighting. Um, and Scott and I have talked quite a bit about uh, specifically in hall, there are some sections that are internal rooms with no natural light um, or, uh, and there's a teacher nodding her head on screen right now, who has a classroom has basically basement casement windows. Um, and so there's very little natural light and there's all sorts of research um, to show the, the importance of, of natural light in the educational process and it's, it's research based. Same thing with uh, um, being able to see outside. There's a lot of data to show that when you can see the outside, the impact on learning. So there's a lot of lighting considerations and windows considerations um, that you have to balance with obviously school security. The other kind of environmental considerations are, you know, around erosion. You don't want your, your water running downhill into your building. Um, and then some of the energy efficiency uh, considerations. And you know, Mansfield went net zero. Um, and so that was one of the considerations that they really wanted to do. And, and I don't know if they're first or second, but I know they're one of the only couple buildings in the state once it's done that is uh, net zero. Um, do you want to speak to that at all, Scott? Uh, sure. It, you know, and, and for the people that don't know, what, what net zero means is that the school over a period of a year produces as much energy as it will use. Um, so it's typically done through photovoltaics. You eliminate the use of all fossil fuels. Um, and it's, it's done with PV systems. So in the winter months when you're running your HVAC systems and all, um, potentially you're using more. Of course, you're attached to the grid. But in the summer months, uh, when the buildings are not occupied, you go into an unoccupied mode, and now your PV is capturing a lot more energy than the building's using, with the ultimate goal of being net zero, net um, energy used um, at the end of a full year cycle. It's interesting, there's a lot of different things you've got to look at as far as how you use a building that's net zero. Plug loads, making sure that things are on automatic switches to go off. You know, that the teachers can't have their little mini fridges in their classrooms tucked away. Um, you know, you got to be careful. And, and also in the case of Mansfield, um, you look at the, one of the biggest producers of, of energy or users of energy is a kitchen. And you theoretically have to modify your menu to some degree uh, because you're only going to have electrical appliances. And so in certain instances, that can be a little bit of a limiting factor. Um, in their case, they felt that, uh, you know, what they could offer was, was more than adequate, um, you know, with that type of a setup. Um, so again, it, it's, it's a philosophy, it's an approach, it's a commitment. It's not just a matter of somebody can design a net zero building, but the users, the end users, the students, the teachers, the town has to embrace it and say, we're going to follow through and make sure that we don't fall into that trap of all of us and having all these unconnected plug loads and leaving computers on overnight and in all these things to really make the building a success. It's, it's certainly something that can be explored. Um, the, the school in Mansfield will be the first public school in the state of Connecticut. There's a few others that are pursuing it, um, but I think Mansfield is gonna be the first one to come online. Um, Office of School Construction Grants and Review is very intrigued. And I think nationally, when you look at our building codes, our energy codes, everything's going in that direction. Um, so, I, you know, I certainly think if you're looking at building or renovating a building to have it, you know, minimum, you know, 50, 60 year life, um, that would absolutely uh, be something that you would want to consider. Catherine, would you try muting so we can get rid of that background sound? I think that's what's interfering. Thank you. So the other um, only other item before I show you the uh, the uh, sample. One of the items was that, you know, the considerations are outdoor spaces, obviously, too. So looking to have what field space you're going to have. Um, and then the other part of that is, is uh, you know, outdoor spaces, thinking about your cafeteria, 
Do you want outdoor seating? What's that look like? Do you want a courtyard? Do you, there's uh, many places that do uh, the kind of farm to table, but it's farm to school where they, they are using some of the vegetables that they're growing and serving students and students are part of that process um, where they have just raised beds. Um, and that's part of the process. So those are all considerations um, that I'll be sharing with the Board of Ed um, as, we, as we develop these. The Mansfield um, sample, uh, this is where it is on the website. Um, so it's, it's, you can see that this uh, on, our, on our school website, there's a school building committee section. This is the old, older one from, from uh, Friar from 1990. This is the ed spec for Mansfield. It's not the current one, but they, because they updated it slightly, but you get the idea. And this is their ed spec. So it taught all the things that I just referred to, and they didn't address all of those things. Um, I've looked at South Windsor. I've got another one that Scott gave me that I'm pulling information in. Um, but one of the things, and I'll just give you an example of what we've worked on. Sorry if I'm making you dizzy. Um, this is kind of the reason why. So this is where you start looking at, okay, so when you have a pre-KK classroom, how many do you need? Um, what is the size of it? And what's the total square footage? And so you talk about flexible spaces. What's a, you know, they've got some a teacher workroom, breakout areas. It builds in all of these items. So pre-KK as a section, um, one to two, three to four, and it goes all the way through all these items. So they, you have the specialty areas that are art, music you know what do you have for special education and that basically breaks down once you take that and then you start and this is what i'm currently working on is you then take that and you identify some of those things that you need in those rooms so this is a pre-k uh room it's got the square footage it's got the number they need and then the items that they need in there so toilet sink what kind of access do you need and when we talk about access this, they just put it directly in here. They chose to do that to remind people that fire code requires that they have ground level access direct out. Um, things like direct access to play area. Uh, the preschool room, and I believe it's at Birch Grove in Tolland, um, has, they have a, a fenced area right, or they did, I haven't been to the new school. They had a fenced area right off their classroom um, that they could go out and it was, they had their own little mini playground that was age appropriate for preschoolers. Again, what do you have for classroom storage, teacher storage, student storage? What's the lighting? What's the flooring? So you're identifying all of those things as you go through what you're looking for for student furniture, um, teacher furniture. What are the other things that you want to have in there? You know, so again, this happens and you go through this for every single program, we'll call it. Um, and then it's just identified out. So, you know, whatever grades. So if grade one to two, it very, they start to blend together a little bit, to be honest with you. There's not significant changes in the elementary picture um, with what you need. You might start getting into lockers or not lockers. Um, but for the most part, you know, you're going to have a bathroom in those pre KK rooms. But once you have first grade, you're probably not going to request a bathroom. You could. Um, but it's not necessarily one of the things that you always see there. So it just builds in the expectation of what the board is looking for when an architect designs a space. What are they looking for? Um, so I'm not going to go through all these. You have access to this one. But again, it just gives you an idea of what is there for each of the, the, the um, you know, the, the, the programs. Questions about the ed specs, I kind of went fast, but I, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on the individual things. That's really what we're working on now. Um, so Phil, thank you for going through uh, all of that. I know you and Scott are making some progress and uh, we look forward to seeing uh, the end result, but I, I know that's going to go through the Board of Education and all that. Um, yeah. I just lost my train of thought. I was going to say something. Why don't we open it up to questions and I'll I'll hopefully, uh, are there any questions or discussions about Phil, what Phil has shared with us today? Catherine, one of the things I'll say too, um, that I thought Mansfield did a good job and I actually reference it still, 
um, is they have on their, it's not their current, and Scott, I'm not sure what the difference is, but they have two web pages. One is a web page that's like current. You can see the live feed of their school being built, but their older page that has kind of the, what I'll call the work that was done to get to that point, they have a, a kind of a section on what I'll call 21st century classrooms and learning spaces. They're short YouTube videos. They're three or four or five minutes long. Um, and it really talks about what people are putting into schools now uh, and how significantly different they are as you build them. Um, so they're, they're just a great resource. I'll be sharing those when I um, start talking to the Board of Ed. But uh, if the committee is interested, you can find it on their, their website. If you go to their main district website, and look for school building committee. It'll bring you to their their older page, um, and it's got a lot of great information on it. Awesome, thank you. Um, I just thought of what I was going to say. As you mentioned um, in in your review, Phil, these ed specs are being created for a pre K through eight school, whether it be a renovation or a new school. And so once these are completed, this is going to be the the guidelines that gets handed over to the design team so that the, the design team actually knows, okay, all right, I need to see, I need to get 16 classrooms, um, a gymnasium, a theater, or, you know, so that they have a sort of a space guideline of how they're gonna start designing um, this school for, for any project. It's not just for this project, but for any, any school project or any other project, they go through uh, something like this, where there's guidelines that you know, it's a minimum for what the architects are going to need to get started with their work. So correct. So how many science labs and, you know, tables, number of tables, it's got a lot of information. And, and again, like Scott said, you don't want to rush through it because you want to make sure you have a complete picture of what you're looking because once you pass it off and, and there are, you'll see this in a lot of ed spec documents where it'll, there'll be five revision dates. Um, because there's new information and they'll update something. Um, but you, your first go around at it, you want to make sure you're, you're pretty comprehensive. Thank you. Did anybody? Yeah, the, the, uh, I'm sorry, Catherine. I was, I was just going to say, no, go in the state of Connecticut, we'll, we'll do a very thorough review and also pose a lot of questions to the ed spec. So there may be, um, at times, I'll, I'll say for lack of a better phrase, a little pushback on the state in certain areas. And they may say, you know, we can't support all this, but it certainly is good to go in with sort of the ultimate plan and present that initially with the understanding that you may get a little pushback in certain areas and have to come back and make a revision prior to the state accepting it. Erica Bushia, do you have any, uh, any feedback as a teacher in the district? I think Phil touched upon a lot of the stuff already. Um, I guess being mindful that we're going to be a pre-K-8 building and that the needs at the elementary level are going to be the, very different than at the middle school level. And I didn't hear mentioned about the land, like if we're going to keep our sports program intact, where's all these sports fields going to go right now? Kids have to travel for softball and baseball. They're not all in the same field. So if everything could fit all together somehow, that'd be ideal. Yeah, it's a good addition. And, and it talks about, you know, age appropriate play spaces, blacktop spaces, playgrounds, because um, obviously a, a, a pre K K playground looks different than what you would probably build for a third, fourth, fifth grader. Um, so good, very good point. That's all part of that ad spec. Anybody else? Thank you, Erica. Well, if there's no additional comments, let's move on to, um, there's just two more items on there for Collier's uh, community engagement and then next steps. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, Catherine, I think that was a, a wonderful, Erica's um, comments were a wonderful bridge. And what I'd like to do briefly before I sort of get into the schedule and next steps is, um, you know, just bring up the very rough concept um, site that I shared as far as you know, potential of what could happen at Hall Memorial School if we were forced to stay on that site. So um, I don't feel if I could share my screen. So this is your, um, this is your, 
uh, option or proposed <clears throat> idea for a hall? This is this is a concept, a and, concept. and again, it's it's, and, I, and I'm not going to really take it any further than this, and, and really not looking to get any technical feedback because it was sort of developed. Again, the 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 Phil and his administrators are reviewing the basic project requirements. So you know, I made some assumptions on what the overall building could hold and what an, an addition might be. Uh, to hold all those components. I'm still waiting for a final list of those components as the EdSpec gets vetted and developed. Um, so that could change this. Um, but, you know, from a very high level, um, you know, you can see that, um, and again, just at this point chose to keep the existing school uh, outline in its configuration. Uh, this does propose demolishing the uh, two locker rooms. Um, what that allows us to do is I'm proposing to make a, a completely separate bus lane, uh, which would dramatically improve traffic as far as parent drop off and parking, separating those, having a bus, a, a new bus drop off road coming off 32, that would allow buses to stack drop off at what is currently the rear of the facility. I think what we would propose is that you would have a new administration area and reception at the back, which would now uh, face the majority of the parking. It, it currently, this shows 93 parking spaces. Um, so with parent drop off, again, our little ones walking in, we want to have that administration, that whole area at the back of the school. Um, you know, this would allow separate parent drop off to circulate around similar as they do drop off at a secured island with um, what we would perceive as ornamental gates or fencing with very specific openings that are controlled. Um, so you would have somebody stationed there in the morning as parents are dropping off, the, the children would be funneled to those gated openings, and then those would come across into the new school. Um, we looked at center school and, and calculated out the current area of their paved play area. So this box replicates um, that uh, specific size that currently exists at center school. Um, also worked with Phil to define what a middle school softball and baseball field requirements would be because um, outfields range quite a bit when you go from, um, you know, can go all the way from uh, little league all the way up to a pro ball field, um, dramatically different. Um, what this line is, the property line, actually, I think there's a, there's a small building right here currently. Uh, but this represents sort of the, 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 the one property line. After this property line, the, the, the grade starts to drop off fairly significantly. There's also, which does not show up on this diagram, there's a stream uh, running through and, and heading down. And what I did and looked at just to see what we could fit on the site is I looked at staying 100 feet away from that wetland area um, from a wetland setback standpoint, grading back up. I think what we would propose in this case is to drop the overall elevation of this field a couple of feet, push that soil towards the stream, grading down, but staying 100 feet away from that stream. And as you can see, it is very tight, um, you know, but again, at it, it, this very high level concept phase, we believe we can get a full baseball, softball field with an overlapping soccer in the, in the outfield on the site. Um, I think uh, if in fact we take this concept further. Um, again, now is not the point to do that, but I think we want to get a full A2T2 survey. So we really had um, accurate grading plans of the current existing condition, because right now what we're doing is interpolating off to town GIS. Um, but, you know, as you can see, um, what we understand as all of the building components, either fitting into the existing building or being put into an addition can fit on the site. Um, one of the other limiting factors here is there really is not much room for any kind of an addition in the future necessarily. Um, so that would certainly be a challenge. Um, you know, you can see right now we've identified a couple of areas for potential pre-K one, two through five playgrounds. These could be gated areas as well as you could put a gate that controls the bus lane. Uh, so no one could enter that in, in during daytime hours that that gate could be controlled. But again, I don't want to get really much further into it. Um, you know, again, high level, we do have a concept, we believe it could work, would certainly need quite a bit more refinement, and may evolve as the EdSpec is developed. Um, so again, this is a, a real preliminary shot, but again, does show that we can uh, very tightly, but, but get those playing fields um, on the site. 
thought just a quick question about the building footprint was that what, what were you calculating for square footage on that um, again, I, I really don't want to, I'd rather hold off on saying that until the ed specs fully developed. I mean, you can see it is a fairly large addition. Um, but the, the existing building is 60,000 square feet. And when you, you look at the requirements of, a, of an elementary school, um, you know, a K-8 school, and what the state standard allows, you know, you have to have a cafeteria, you have to have a kitchen, you have to have a gymnasium, all these support spaces, special ed spaces. So you could have a gymnasium, cafeteria, special ed spaces that can support a school of 400, where those spaces could support a school of six to 700. Uh, when you get to six to 700 students, with the way the space standard works is in, in essence, all you'd need is additional classrooms. Um, but when you get down to the smaller numbers, such as the cases in Willington, where you have just over 400, you still need that core support spaces. That takes up a lot of square footage. So it puts a lot of pressure on that space standard. You know, so the space standard is is somewhere in the you know low sixty thousand or sixty thousand square foot range, and, and you're probably somewhere up in the seventy thousand square foot range. But again, uh, don't want to get into any specifics on that um, until the ed specs develop, and then those are certainly conversations we'll have with the state of Connecticut. I think they can understand the logic behind we you can you know you can only make a gymnasium so small, and you can only make a cafeteria so small, it's got to, you know, be sized with a kitchen to feed the students. So, right. you know, there are constraints that when you're talking about smaller numbers, make it a little bit of a more challenge to, uh, to design a facility to that size. Thank you. So as, as far as communication um, outreach, I'm going to kind of tie these two together. Um, I've been working on an updated uh, sort of milestone schedule um, locking in where our building committee meetings are. Actually, I can, I can go ahead and share this as well. Um, just showing kind of what we've done to date, grayed out in, in some of the, you know, again, just popping in some of our, our building committee, you know, we're right here um, on the 16th. Um, you know, we met as, um, as we heard, we met Monday with our um, site selection subcommittee. Um, I'm going to be going out to the town uh, this Friday in, in physically looking at a few of the sites that have been identified as possibilities. Uh, you can only gather so much information from town GIS. I'm also gonna be um, contacting Mike D'Amato uh, from planning department, have some conversations with him as well. Um, spoken with, um, with Phil, um, you know, I said, as soon as he's ready, you know, we're, we'll take a look at uh, the draft ed spec you know, see with our experience on other projects, identify potentially any holes, areas where we see that there may need to be something else added to that ed spec. Uh, Follow it up with our, our building committee. Again, I'm hoping that after our early April building committee meeting and, and um, site selection meeting, uh, beginning of April on, on April 4th, that we may have been able to lock in on a few um, potential sites for a little bit of a deeper dive in, in development. Um, and with that, uh, after review with that subcommittee and full building committee, potentially start looking at developing both a concept budget and a schedule for those two options. Again, very high level, not real detailed, using um, current bid numbers that we're getting. You know, Colliers, we, we are lucky to manage, you know, quite a number of school construction projects throughout the state. We've got a very strong history of historical data as well as tracking current trends with procurement and inflation. Uh, but we'd be looking to develop a, you know, start to develop a, a both a budget and schedule for those two options. Um, again, take those to our site, sub, uh, site selection subcommittee, building committee later in April, review those. And uh, with the approval of the committee at that point for that very high level information we're gonna start generating, then I think at that time, it may be appropriate. We, um, we've also had an ed spec, at least initial ed spec that will have been presented to the board as Phil stated on April 5th, um, reach out and set up a meeting with, with OSCGR in the state. Um, you know, we've got our preliminary ed spec. We've identified very high level of couple of options, sit down with the table, bring our information to them as far as our space study, the standards and, and start that dialogue um, to what they may or may not support and what some of our options and choices would be. 
With that input, then we would look to start creating some initial public information materials. Again, I think it would be a little um, premature until we have that meeting with the state to start talking about what some of our options are. I think we really need to understand what their support is. Again, their support is not, um, you know, it, it, it's a decision to, depending on, you know, what they say of, of what the, this committee puts forward to the town and what the town would vote on. Um, but I think it's, it's critical that we have that information and then uh, certainly be following that up with the uh, building committee, site subcommittee. So sometime in, in, in late April, probably early May, look to have our, our first potential information session with the public, be able to, once we've, we've created this material, review it with the site selection committee, review it with this building committee beginning of May. After that, once we've vetted that information, then could look at some of the avenues, um, public meeting, Facebook page, some of the ways to start getting out some of that early basic information. And then after that, it's going to be allowing the public to digest that initial pass at the information. And then we sit back and listen and, and respond to some questions um, and, and see what the reaction is to the public to the, the potential options. This is great. Thank you. All right, any discussion about what Scott um, just shared with us as far as the milestone schedule and um, our next steps in community engagement? It sounds like uh, the, the earliest we would have any kind of town um, community session would be sometime in May or a little later, uh, depending on the progress of what Scott just outlined. Any discussion or questions for Scott regarding that? No? Okay. Um, let's jump down to new business then. So as I mentioned earlier in my chairperson's report, um, this the, the charge of the committee is uh, to identify potential future uses of two current school buildings if necessary. Uh, we wanted to take the opportunity as a committee to maximize our time and while other things are going on uh, in the background, uh, we wanted to take some time to at least tackle this task um, as it is part of our charge. And so it was suggested to be put on the agenda for this meeting. So um, I, I'm not really sure where to start, but other than the discussion of future use of buildings, does anybody on the floor want to start the conversation? <laughs> Erica? I think it might be easiest for us to start with center school since we've already determined that we're looking at um, two paths a potential renovation of Hall School or a new school and a new site. So one of those projects happens that for sure leaves us with center school no longer being used as a school. So I think that's the easiest place for us to start with okay. um, potential uses. Uh, I'll start with what I think some potential um, future plans with that could be. I see a couple of avenues. Um, the town maintains it and uses it for repurposes it for another uh, facility. Again, this is just a, a thought process and there would simply, uh, there would need to be funding for any of these ideas. Um, uh, renovate it and use it for a town hall uh, and community spaces and potential revenue of some of the spaces, right? I think there's more space in there than we would maybe need. Um, we sell the land with the building on it as is, um, or we demolish the building um, and I'm not sure what that would accomplish, right? If we demolish the building, would we be looking to build something else there? Um, I know the fire department has looked at um, needing a new facility. Could it be used for that? Um, or do we demolish it and then try to sell it? It is an R80 zone, um, this area. So if we were to demo the building, it, it could be then um, potentially sold in individual building lots. So those are just some... Um, off the top of my head concepts. Picking up on that, Erica. Great. Thank you, um, Erica. Go ahead, Ralph. I think there's a, there's enough area there that could be four uh, residential lots. It has the potential for that. I, I can't see it going any larger than, the, or you know, being subdivided into more than four. Uh, if if the building were demolished, I, I I think it's a it becomes a financial consideration at that point. Um, 
you know, do we invest money in this building that's uh, 60, 70 years old, the core? Or do we um, take another approach to it? And I, I don't have the answer the, yet, but um, I, I don't know what residential lots would go for. So in today's market, who knows? Yeah, those are some great suggestions. Um, does anybody else, Ralph, do you have any additional suggestions? No, no uh, to go ahead. Eric, that line? Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Gary. Just a couple kind of preliminary thoughts. Uh, you know, I, to me, the building seems like it, unless it's for some kind of public use, as Erica mentioned, you know, offices of some sort, uh, maybe the gymnasium could be repurposed somehow. Uh, but it's not going to be reutilized into, you know, any really anything beyond that. So, um, you know, I think just having that in our minds, um, it's not, it's not really a building that's conducive to, you know, housing or, or something else, some, some other use like that. So I think the choices are probably to repurpose it as another public use or to demolish it, um, just, just in my first take. Uh, and then I would also bring up, um, you know, part of the discussion today is if, if we are looking at a small-ish site like Hall, the Hall School property, uh, we know that one of the one of the kind of negatives there is the the kind of lack of of, of field space um, compared to perhaps some other schools sites elsewhere, maybe not even in Wellington, and that might be one thing that we're looking to, um, or we may need to relocate things in other places or locate things in other places. So just having the flexibility of of at least uh, uh, the fields that are at center, which aren't significant, but they're, you know, they're, they are there. Um, so I think we should kind of just keep that in mind as, a, as an opportunity if, uh, if we need it there. So those are my thoughts for right now. Thank you, Gary. Anybody else? Peter? Just unmute. That's unmute, sorry. Um, I just wanted to add to the discussion that we, we all talked about this in the finance subcommittee um, and recognize that any project we put forward needs to take these costs into consideration. Um, and as I'll share some of the, the discussion, um, it would make a certain amount of sense uh, for the baseline to be demolition. Um, because it's unlikely the town could fund a new school project, fund sustained maintenance of a retained building, and then fund again yet another large capital project to repurpose that building. Is it conceivable? Maybe, um, but all of those costs would, would have to be identified so that the, the public has some sense of this and some perspective. Um, so I, one of the things we noted was that the one thing everyone seems to agree on and you just, or I think, spoke about it earlier, Phil, um, is that the Board of Ed, this committee, and the town has consensus that we want a single K-8 building. So it, I, I think we need to look at the potential of demolishing both, both buildings um, and returning that land to the private sector and moving forward with the project we would seek. Thank you, Peter. Catherine, can I add um, that ahead, in the uh, CIP plan, one of the projects that was submitted from the uh, selectmen was um, a facility study to look at our current facilities, anticipating that um, possibly in the next fiscal year, we would have taken a project to referendum. And then that would require us to invest some money into looking at our current facilities to help us with this. Well, this committee will make some recommendations. We really need to then um, get a sense of those facilities and how they could be used for the town. So um, to Peter's point, yes, they, in all of those options will take funding and trying to get a sense of what that will be out of a, a facilities need study for the town. But it, Eric, while we're talking about schools, uh, certainly this building has its own challenge. The building I'm currently in <laughs> has yeah. many challenges. But that would be something that would that would come out of the board of selectmen's office, right? I mean, yes. You know. But so in in hand with what we're what we would recommend, 
when, you know, as we um, potentially vote on a project that will move forward and then hand this out back over to the town, it would, you know, then some funding has already been started in the work so that we can look at a, an overall um, needs assessment for um, the rest of the town. Okay. Phil? I want to clarify something with Scott. You said about $30 a square foot for demolition? That's correct. You know, demolition and abatement. I mean, again, depending on the level of um, existing materials, you know, whether on the foundation, under the floors. Um, yeah, but I think $30 is, is a good number to use these days. So you're looking at a million bucks to, to demolish um, center school. It's about 30,000 square feet. Again, give or take, right? We're ballparking it. Scott, what do you see? I mean, you, you obviously are the expert in the room here around these things. What do you see people using older buildings for? Are they walking away from them? Are they selling them as is? Are they demolishing them? What, what do you see as some of the trends? We, we see all different types of in, in approaches. In some instances, um, you know, you put out proposals for a developer, um, you know, as, as Ralph had pointed out, um, you know, it's potentially, you know, about eight acres. So maybe it could be subdivided into four two acre sites. Um, so you might get proposals from a developer to um, purchase the land or take that upon itself and, and, and demolish the building and, and put up, you know, some residential uh, units. Um, yeah, I think, I think Eric is right on point where we do see a lot of, when, the, when these types of projects are anticipated, we do see a lot of municipalities taking a, a, a holistic approach and really looking at all the town offices and before they uh, you know, potentially demolish something that in fact may be in better shape than one of the other existing buildings they have. So, you know, there could be a, a sort of a chain of events uh, that are generated by, um, you know, a building project. So it, it's really, there isn't one, um, you know, there's not one answer that fits every, every condition. It's, it's really, there's multiple ways that communities are, are kind of addressing these situations. You know, we see the need at, you know, we've, we've seen senior centers um, we've seen, um, you know, some have taken older schools and made just a pre-K facility, uh, standalone pre-K, um, if that's a need in the community. Um, or again, as, as Erica pointed out, you know, town offices, that's always a, certainly a popular uh, thought, depending on what your current infrastructure is. Do you see, Scott, if, if, if there's no solution, do you, see, is it cheaper just to sell or do you, and I say sell, are you selling it for a dollar because it's cheaper to do that than spend the million to demo it? Do you see places doing that? Um, in, in essence, yeah, we have seen that a, a few times. I mean, something again, depending on the location and the value of the property, um, you know, sometimes that value you know, would exceed the demolition costs. Um, we've also seen in cases where there were historic buildings, such as Hall Memorial, where again, you put it out to developers and said, the existing historic building must remain and must be part of your development proposal. You know, you can rip off the additions, you can do anything else. You know, those, those old buildings make wonderful, um, you know, apartments at times and can be developed and potentially with an addition for other, um, you know, other housing um, on them. So, um, you know, you can stipulate it, um, you know, certainly, it's, it's hard when you're talking about a 30,000 square foot building on an eight acre site, you know, there's not a lot you can do with an eight acre site. You know, again, as Ralph pointed out, it could be four, um, you know, residential lots. Um, you know, so you'd also have to take into account, you know, how long is that building gonna sit there? And, you know, would you have uh, short term costs maintaining it until the decision could be made? You know, which in fact, it may say it's just cheaper. Let's take it down and throw some grass on it, regrade it. And, um, you know, versus trying to maintain it and having any of those other costs. And again, the $30, you know, that is a is, is sort of a, a thumb, you know, best guess at this point. Again, you know, we can review the asbestos management plan, some of the other things. You know, the building, in fact, may not, you know, require a, a higher level of abatement associated with its demolition. So maybe that number comes down a little bit. But, you know, we also know that we're talking about, you know, a process that's probably four years down the road, um, you know, by the time you come to a decision, get something through the public, 
build the project, transfer everyone in. Um, so, you know, I think I think a thirty dollar a square foot is 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 certainly a, a good safe number to utilize at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Did you have something? Well, I was actually going to say something similar when before Phil brought that up. So, yeah, I mean, I think at some point the town would have the choice of whether to whether to demolish a building. You know, again, if if we're not going to use the building, to demolish it or to have somebody else do it. And you're basically assessing when, you know, whether you eat that cost up front or, or whether you let somebody else do it and then get less for the land. So, you know, when the finance committee and others are talking about it, that that's something to take into account, uh, perhaps that um, either way, it's, it's, it's probably a net zero uh, using that term that we've talked about before today. Um, but, you know, if, if the concern is not not having funding for that upfront, it, it, it might be something that, that a private developer would be willing to do or would be able to do, uh, but then we're talking about, you know, the amount that we get for the property, if anything. So really and nothing I think additional. Just I, if I might, as a comparison, you know, when you think about, especially with the escalations we've seen these days, you know, you're probably looking at a new roof for that facility of about $25 a square foot. And that's just putting a roof on it, not addressing all of the other um, longer term needs as far as plumbing, mechanical systems, upgrades, and other things. So um, again, from a cost benefit standpoint, um, you know, you, you could factor, you know, if you were going to keep it at all, you'd have to put a new roof on it. And a new roof is going to cost just about as much as it would to demolish the building. Thank you. Peter? Uh, I just wanted to add to that, that uh... I think it's important for us to avoid a situation where we said, oh, we'll think of something in the future and then be in a situation like our neighbors in Stafford with the Wit School. <laughs> I know, Eric, you're probably familiar with that. Um, or, or, or Willimantic, where they had older buildings where they said, oh, we'll do something. And then they sit for a long time and become an enormous problem. So I... I think it's important for us to, to identify these issues early and have a clear path. Yeah, the, on, the only clarification I would say is that our, our charge is somewhat limited, Peter. Um, so we, we were asked to come up with potential uses. So I don't know how much say we'll actually have in how they actually manage uh, the buildings after we establish the direction we're gonna go as a committee. Um, but I, I agree with you. I think definitely exploring what the options are, trying to put some numbers to it. And then we present that to uh, the Board of Selectmen. And then ultimately they will have to, they'll take our recommendation and then they'll have to, you know, make a decision from the, from the Board of Selectmen's office. So we're, we're somewhat limited in this committee, but I do agree with you. I would anticipate that this, very conversation that piece of our charge will come up as we uh, enter into the community engagement portion. So as we start to have public meetings, uh, Scott, that must be common that folks are gonna say, great, while I may support this, what about the other buildings and what is that cost implication to us? Right. So we, we, may, we may not be able to make the ultimate decision, but having put some real thought and conversation into the cost implication of all those, I think is important. Scott, I, look, we don't do everything Mansfield does, but I'm just curious since they are going from three schools to one, um, one completely new school, do you know what their plan is? I, I know, I believe they were doing a needs assessment as well. Exactly, yeah, they're, they're currently doing a needs assessment. Um, you know, we know that the one, one of the three schools as part of the building project is coming down and will be raised, but yes, they are currently doing a full town-wide needs assessment uh, to see what, if, anything they will do with the other facilities. And again, I know um, at least one of them with its adjacency to the University of Connecticut may be desirable. So, um, you know, they may have some options uh, available to themselves that, you know, unfortunately Willington may not have. I agree. <laughs> They're a little bit in a better spot. Great discussion. Um, so do we wanna jump into uh, the discussion on hall or do you, what do you guys think? Do you want to take? Do you want to table that until our next meeting? 
Or do you want I, to continue? I don't see what we really have no harm in starting to toss around some ideas about that. It's if new school on a new site is one of our options, then I think we have to um, talk about what we would do if um, Hall School was no longer um, used as a school. Hey, Ralph. Thank you, Erica. If Hall School is no longer used as a school, then we don't have any say in what happens to the property in the building. That, that is currently true, um, but I, I suppose one of the things is there, you know, could be a change in the deed. We don't know that, right? We haven't had any public conversations um, with anyone from the Hall Foundation to know um, what their um, anticipated use of that property was. So, um, and I, I don't know that there's harm in us having a conversation about what we would recommend and if they chose to take back ownership for the deed, you know, maybe we have some suggestions to offer. Thank you. Anyone else? Gary? Well, I mean, the Hall School building is a much different building than, than center schools. Uh, you know, it was built in a different time, it built a little bit differently. Uh, I mean, just, just looking at it and knowing what I know about the building, uh, you know, housing would make sense in a building like that in terms of a repurposed, that type of building is often repurposed into housing, whether that's senior housing, whether that's whatever type of house, housing it is. Um, and then, you know, the fact that there's a, you know, gymnasium and fields there is, is interesting as well. So, I mean, to me, that's the first thing that jumps out. I know, I happen to know that that's you know, if we were just to put out an RFP, that's probably what we would get. You know, there's a the multifamily housing is, is really driving the market in Connecticut. If, you know, that an industrial, and it's not going to be an industrial site probably. Um, so that's just the first thing that, that jumps out to me again, unless there was a need for it for administrative offices or something like that. Just again, that's not about whether or not that should be the use, but in terms of the structure and the reuse of the, the actual physical building. Thank you, Gary. And as you mentioned, Gary, this is uh, definitely much different than center. Um, there are, as Erica was alluding to, the um, Hall Foundation deed, it, it does have some restrictions that it has to be used as a school. Um, so that's what Erica was referring to. If we were to identify another use for it, we would have to do something with the deed language um, to say that it could be used other uh, on something other than a school, because currently right now the, the restriction is that it has to be used by a school, uh, as a school. Um, so there, there is a little bit different dynamic there um, with respect to that, but um, certainly those are some good ideas, housing, administration, um, senior housing. Any other ideas, Peter? Sorry. Um, just to, to say that I agree with all, all everything that was said already, um, a strict reading of the deed as we know it now would suggest that the Hall Foundation would prefer it remain an educational institution. So where, whereas that may not be us, it could be another educational institution. Yep. Um, that said, um, yep. it's really hard to have this conversation until we know what flexibility the Hall Foundation would give us for non-educational use as a town. So the sooner we can find that out, uh, the more meaningful this conversation can be. Thank you, Peter. Brianna, you had your hand up. I agree with you, Peter, <laughs> right? The sooner we can hear from the Hall Foundation, the better, certainly. And I'm just wondering, is it possible that we are responsible for uh, the additions that were added to the original building? Because that's something that we did for our school district. No. Um, can we, no, it's all the same. No, all the improvements that we've done um, uh, go with the land uh, and under that deed restriction. So um, it, 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 what we've done doesn't matter. It goes back to the Hall Foundation as it's currently worded. What about the smaller parcels of land that the town owns, like the parking lot and driveway space and whatnot? The driveway <laughs> on the 
on the north side it would be ours. The soccer field on the south side would be ours. The rest of it is all on the original hall school property. So uh, then are we that, responsible for a driveway and a field? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to nowhere. <laughs> well, it'll be to somewhere, but. Like, would we have to sell that to the Hall Foundation? Could we gift it to them? Are those possibilities? Yep. Well, anything's some possible. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Erica, you have your hand up. Thank you, Brianna. Yeah. So some of the things uh, Brianna brought up are um, what I was going to mention. It's it's really important that we begin having those conversations and that at some point, I hope uh, the Hall Foundation is willing to come publicly to the table with us because we do own adjacent pieces of property. And I think, uh, you know, I, I don't know what we do with the parking lot across the street, right? It's not even attached to the facility, but the, the, the fields, um, well, I, I believe across the street goes with the, uh, is that separate, Phil, or does that go with the building? That's the one that goes with the building. Well. That goes with the building. So, you know, the driveway, uh, you know, we don't need a, a driveway and we don't need, um, you know, just a soccer field that they'd be in. Uh, the benefit yep. would be to go together. So there needs to be some sort of, at some point, some sort of cooperative conversation for us to decide what to do with the two pieces that would remain with the town. Right. Um, and so I would hope that they could come to the table soon. But I was intrigued when um, Scott mentioned, um, let's let's imagine for a moment that we, the town is able to do something with the facility as a whole. And we are making the final decisions for what happens to going forward, being able to put out an RFP with some restrictions um, that possibly say, leave the remaining um, original structure and build that into a future use. That you know certainly is intriguing to me, and and I would imagine possibly to the Hall Foundation as well that there could be a future use for that facility for that facility, and the facade remain um, you know a portion of that. So that's not something uh, you know I think I had thought of before. Um, is that pretty common, Scott? Yeah. Do, do you, Gary's shaking his head in his planning world. That happens a lot. Yeah, that, that, it does happen a lot. And, and again, I mean, it, it really doesn't, except for the, the standpoint of putting together some basic information in an in RFP package, you know, bringing some developers down to the site. You know, you, you're letting them, and you're not necessarily defining, you know, maybe you say you're going to define, the only def, uh, requirement is that existing building has to stay. But, okay, Mr. Developers, what, what's your vision? What do you see this becoming? Um, you know, and because they're they're the ones who know how to make the buck. I mean, they're they're investing a lot of their money uh, because they want to do something that's nice and something that they're going to be able to turn in and, and make something profitable. So they should be able to determine better than we what that site would hold and support and what would generate the most money, not only for themselves but potentially tax revenue long term for the town of Wellington. Scott, what's the timing on that? Because you know, it's hard where you want to say, hey, you know, if, if the decision is made to go elsewhere and, and we leave both buildings and you're talking about, and this is to Peter's point, we're talking about what's the total cost, right? Because you're, yeah, you would be building a new building, but there's a cost to, if you're demolishing center or you're renovating center, there's a cost to those things. Where does that happen? When do you bring those developers in to say, can you give us some thoughts on this? And Gary's got his hand up because this is your, probably your life. <laughs> um, what does that happen? Because I don't know. Well, you'd you you'd okay. want it, the the developers would want some certainty, right? So you wouldn't want to do it before you. It would be, you know, you might get something, you know, if we were to do it like now. But I don't I don't think so. I think for for people that were serious about wanting to redevelop it, they'd want to know that yes, the town is is interested in selling this property um, with these you know conditions in place. So I, I think we'd have to wait for that. That doesn't mean we can't go out and kind of, um, you know, ask some developers and and informally ask them what they what they think. Have them come by the site, and say, "Hey, what do you think?" Um, there's no harm in that, and there's you know, we lose nothing by doing that. So that that's what I would suggest if we're interested in getting some feedback there. But for an RFP for response, you're you're really asking somebody to seriously say, "Here's the here's what I'm willing to spend. Here's what I'm willing to do, and here's what's possible on that property." 
And in that case, they'll be spending their own resources and money. So you really, they probably would wait until, you know, we were serious about it. <clears throat> so it would be reasonable then just to say, hey, just come and give us a, a, some ideas. Uh, that's, I think that we should do that sooner than later for both buildings because it may help us. E even though it's not rock solid, I think we get some ideas because based upon what, what Gary just said, this is where you don't want to make decisions on anything until you know something's complete, right? So you wouldn't want to make a decision on the building until you knew if you were going to leave the site that you had a referendum passed and you had grant funding. Once that happens, then you want to move. But I think that's going to be really clear for the public that, you know, we we're saying we can't make, well, we can't make this recommendation or, you know, we can say this is what we believe, but we don't know what the actual you know, proposals will be. So if we can get that feedback now, just as general feedback, and if you guys have leads on that, I, I would say that might be something that, you know, just to, you know, are we missing something? I, mean, I don't know. Thank you. Erica? Bushia? Yeah. Am um, I saying your name right? I'm sorry. It's that, fine. Okay. It's Bushor, it's fine. <laughs> sure. I mean, okay. Since they're already like their school facilities, I don't know if there's been any thought about um, instead of outplacing students, we keep our students in house and then we open it to other districts. I mean, they would pay us to send their students. I mean, it's a whole nother part of our educational system. And I don't know how Phil would feel about like taking that on because it's a whole nother administrator and, but it would create revenue because we'd be taking in, in other, other town students. Um, and housing them here, we wouldn't have any students going out. So it would be cost saving and still repurposing those school built because they are school buildings. So it's ready to go. There are some places that have done that within their, um, within their current uh, structures and they've actually closed them because they've been more expensive when it's a separate site. If they can build it into their current facility, it, it's worked for them. Um, but we, it'd be interesting to find out, are there any one, you know, folks that are making, that are successful doing that? That's something that we could research just to find out. Um, yeah. Peter, I'm sorry. I'll go to you at next, Erica. I'm okay. just, just some mute, Peter. Sorry. I want to throw that back to Phil because I, I remember from the region 19 uh, meetings that I've attended that they have that depot campus where they collect the uh, special uh, ed students or something to that effect there. Well, is that fiscally sound? Like, like that's separate from EO Smith. It's way over there on the depot campus. Does that work for them? I don't know a lot about the depot campus, to be honest with you, Peter, but it's something that, again, I, it's a high school. So, uh, you know, I'd be curious to know how they make it work. Like Erica said, it's got a separate administrator. You know, they've got separate teachers. They've got a separate campus. Um, you still have to provide all the facilities, I guess. So um, I don't know how it works though, but that's, I mean, when you start talking about outplacement facilities and you're looking at, you know, full-time social worker, full-time school psychologist, full-time special education teachers, paraprofessionals, transportation, um, the costs add up fast, but it depends on the clientele too. If you have, you know, 10 cases, I mean, right now, some of what these places are charging is astronomical. So it's definitely worth researching to find out. Thank yeah, you. It's a, it's a good idea to look into. Uh, Erica? Yeah, Erica of, uh, when we were talking about um, center school um, and one of my ideas and thoughts was if we were to repurpose it as a town hall, I don't know that we would need the entire structure and if some of it could be used. And this was one of the thoughts um, that I had to bring in revenue and it was based off conversations um, with folks from other towns who have had smaller um, school facilities used for outplacement like uh, things attached to a town hall and it and my first thought was what <laughs> um, security wise how does that work so there are all kinds of creative ways that that these things are happening and so it's a potential revenue source for us. And so why not at least investigate down the road? But to Erica and Phil's point, it may not be financially um, feasible, but I'd be curious to start investigating whether or not, or how these work in other communities. Hmm. 
Right, because other communities are are doing it. So it must be, you know, it must be beneficial to them in one way, shape or form, maybe not entirely on a financial uh, respect, but, you know, it's a good idea. Uh, any other revenue uh, suggestions of how these two school um, existing buildings could be used for as a revenue source? Could I suggest that Gary or Scott, if you know anyone, could we? Is that something we could arrange for someone to? I mean, I'm glad to go walk a building with someone. Uh, I'm glad to do that if that would be helpful. Um, I just don't know if you have uh, folks in mind that would be willing to do that. And obviously, I don't want to carry put you in a position that would be awkward either. Mm. Yeah, let me think. Let me think about if there's somebody locally that might just do it for as like a favor. Uh, I'll, I'll think about it. Yeah, maybe Scott, if you um, if you think of something too over the next week or so that comes up, we can certainly. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll certainly put the feelers out again. You know, there may be a list of and, and just talk about from our standpoint, our history of, you know, when the, the timing has been appropriate or when people have been more receptive to coming in and, and making a bit of an effort. So, uh, yeah, let me let me see what I can uh, research on my side as well. Right. Any other discussion on this topic? If not, we can move to any uh, suggestions for future business that we can put on our next agenda. Erica? Not necessarily future business, but as um, we're starting to see things come back into uh, in person, is this something that this group wants to take a look at? As far as I know, I know nothing um, to the contrary. April 30th will end the ability for us to hold hybrid meetings. There's been nothing formally out there after that. So at that point, we'd have to go back to in-person. Um, so just, we might wanna start giving it some thought. Okay, thank you. Well, there's no. Um, Go ahead, Ralph. No, no discussion about uh, allowing towns to continue uh, to conduct meetings via Zoom. There. I didn't say I there may. was a discussion. There's been no formal <laughs> uh, movement on it. Gary, do you know anything different? Yeah. No, that's right, Erica. I I would assume that there will be, but you know, I, I guess we know what 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 happens when we assume, right? <laughs> but, um, yes. Yes. Uh, there's, there should be. I mean, this. I think it's impossible to go back now um, because people are going to want to participate remotely, and it's going to be impossible to put that genie back in the bottle. But to Erica's point, <laughs> right now we don't know when that's going to be, and we don't know, you know, what that law is going to be. So um, I would, I would expect that we'd still be able to do hybrid meetings, but it's probably safer to to be safe than sorry. <clears throat> Yeah, I, quite frankly, I was hoping by now we were just over a month away from that, that there would be something a little bit more concrete that would at least be circulating as, you know, what that would look like. Um, but seeing none of that um, yet. <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Erica, even if it even if it does technically end, don't we have the choice, uh, much like we give the, the kids the choice now to not wear masks. I mean, don't we have a choice to to continue with the hybrid? No. We don't. No. No, the state statute state is statute. ancient. So it says that you have to have a you have In to have 15. a public location, right? And that's I where the, they assume the meeting's going to be. So that was yeah. that was um that that was uh, sort of overreached by the <laughs> by the governor and by the legislature for for covid purposes. Um, and they keep sticking these types of things in, in proposed laws um, that to make them permanent. But I haven't, to Erica's point again, I haven't seen that be permanent. It's about it's about uh, you know open meeting law essentially, making sure that people have access to meetings, which is which makes sense. But now this is what gives people access to meetings. So 
hopefully Catherine, they'll go that direction. What we can do, let's imagine that April 30th comes and there's no uh, you know, change in, in the statutes. Um, we could still utilize um, a forum in which to broadcast our meeting, but the participation would have to be in the room. So this committee would have to be in person in a public space. We could still record it and make it either live streamed or a recording available, but the public participation would come in the room. I see. Like it was before. So thank you. Stay yeah. tuned, but I think we should prepare. Um, <laughs> I think there'd be some benefit to get us, getting us together. Uh, Bill, thank you. I don't know uh, how you do this as an, I think it has, has to be an agenda item if you're gonna do it as a group, but um, it may make sense to, I mean, Collins right next door. They just built a brand new school. I don't know if it makes sense to try and schedule a tour for the committee. Uh, you've seen what our current schools look like and uh, it'd be nice to see, I have not been to the new facility um, but, you know, it's something that I wonder if we could organize and, and do it after hours. Um, I don't know for public purposes what that would look like for Tallinn, because I'm sure they wouldn't want 50 people walking their building, but they may allow um, the committee to do it. So I'm not sure how we would set that up, but I think it might be worthwhile to see what a new building looks like. I just, you know, I mean, because, I mean, they j literally just opened. We don't have to necessarily call that a meeting um, where public participation is, it has to be permitted. Um, we, well, I don't, I, I take that back. I, I'm just thinking of site walks uh, on planning and zoning. We would do them they and are the public, public, they are public, yes, <laughs> but there was no conversation allowed in that uh, site walk. Normally, um, what we see is you'd have to you'd have to stage just a couple of sessions, whether it's 45 minute or an hour with a group that just is below your uh, threshold for quorum. So yeah, if, if, you're, if you're meeting on a you know, project related issue and you have a quorum, it's a formal meeting. So you would, Scott, would be my input. <laughs> people do that. So, so I'm assuming you, you wouldn't be able to get everyone through like we did for our tours, because I mean, I'm not sure a school district would wanna do that. Um, but you're just saying you do a, a smaller group that doesn't meet quorum and that's who would get to go. Yes, well, or, you know, if, if you, right. Or if you could, yeah, if you could schedule it from, you know, okay, five to six group A and six to seven group B, for example. So Catherine, that's my thought. It might, I, I don't know if people would be interested in that, but uh, it may be worthwhile. I don't know. Okay. I'd love, I'd love to see the inside. I've seen the outside of Birch Grove. I've drove, driven around it, but I have not seen the inside. And if we did four, four, and three, we wouldn't have a quorum. Yeah, we just don't want a quorum. <laughs> oh, I understand. So I'd be happy to reach out to the uh, superintendent's office and see see what they're willing to uh, to do. I can reach out to this. Walter too. I, I've worked with him. Um, he's superintendent talent and I also wanted to ask him because they did run a special education program um, that I believe they shut down. And so I'm curious, I wanted to get his thoughts on that just to see the why. Um, yeah. So, you know, I'm glad to do that too, just to see if it's something he'd consider. Yeah. No, I, I think the timing is actually really good too, because you're going to be seeing firsthand uh, what you guys are currently developing, which is the ed specs. You're going to see it firsthand, like in three dimension. <laughs> um, so it it'll be nice to to actually, you know, put those two together and 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 see what. Oh, okay, this is what it would look like if we did. Um, whether it's a, a new or renovation, uh, regardless, even if it's a renovation, it looks like a new space and it will be a new footprint, like square footage wise. So, um, yeah, I, I I think that's that's a good idea. Okay, so if he says yes, I'll just have uh, Brenda reach out and, and try and schedule a few times if they allow a few times um, and, and go from there. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is if, if they're only willing to accommodate a few people at a time, maybe we could do, you know, one this month and maybe span it out maybe next month, do another 
you know, the second tour or whatever. Uh, I, know they the just... I know the principal too. So, uh, you know, I just might, might mean I have to buy him dinner or something, but we can <laughs> also <just> say. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, were there any other hands up or suggestions to, okay, Gary? There, well, there was one thing that the, uh, the building and land land assessment committee uh, had suggested. So I don't know if we want to talk about that now or add it to the next meeting, but um, we were we were going to suggest, and Mike probably would say it better than me, suggest that we uh, get the message out to the community that, that if there are people that want it, that own properties that are 20 or more acres and would be interested in donating them, we feel like we should get the word out. So just passing that along. And I think we already hit on that in this meeting, didn't we? I think I thought Phil said he was at least going to put that in the Willington Wire article since he had heard okay. that in the, from watching the meeting. Perfect. So I guess it's taken care of. Thank you. Yeah, and I can hit Facebook and things like that too. Yeah, we'll yeah do, I uh, guess you know, like a uh, banner flying around town. We'll see if that <laughs> pays attention. I'm sure Although that's as, we, as sure we've that's seen, the there's, <laughs> there's, there's not a lot of land in Willington that, <laughs> right. that is level enough for a school at all. So we'll, we'll, be, we'll be happy with any, anybody that reaches out at all, I think. <clears throat> yeah. Well, currently, it, it sounds like it's only going to be in the Wellington wire. So, um, you know, there, there are other communication methods. So if there are suggestions about where to post that, Phil just mentioned Facebook. Um, yeah, it could definitely be there. I, I didn't know if uh, there was going to be a memo. Did, were you guys going to put a memo together or uh, it was just an idea to just get it out there? Honestly, I don't think we know. I think Mike, Mike knows what he was going to do and he's not here, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I could talk to him, but as the communications yeah. committee, we can put that out. Okay. All right. Any other um, suggestions before we leave this topic? Any other uh, future agenda items? Scott, did you have anything? <laughs> I have... No, I'm, I'm all set uh, for this evening. Thank you, Catherine. All right, uh, let's move on to present to speak. Is there anyone uh, on the phone that would like to speak? Just state your name. Okay, present to speak. All right, let's move to adjourn the meeting. Um, I believe our next meeting is April 6th, uh, but let's, is there a motion on the floor to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Erica, thank you. Second. Ralph, all in favor? Aye. Say aye. aye. All right. All right. Meeting is adjourned. It is now 8.09 p.m. Have a nice weekend, you guys. We'll see you on the 6th. Thank you as well. Good night.